Okay, great. Why don't we, why don't we uh, get going? Um, uh, I just want to, my name is Samir Asher. I'm a professor at uh, UCI Law. Uh, I am a um, clinical professor of law. I'm the, uh, an associate dean for equity initiatives and also director of the Worker Law and Organizing Clinic, uh, which we, it's a new core clinic, which we just started last year. And so it's, it's especially appropriate to have this panel and to have three exemplary uh, alums uh, who worked on workers' rights cases as part of the Immigrant Rights Clinic um, at UCI Law uh, when they were in law school. Um, the first thing I want to do before I say anything further is to thank uh, folks. Thank uh, Amanda Lay, um, who is uh, a student, a uh, current student at UCI Law, who did more than anyone to make this program happen, uh, to bring us together and drive our agenda. To Jillian Henry, who is uh, running uh, this webinar um, and uh, does lots of things uh, to make uh, all of this work. And then finally, to Anna Davis, who's been carrying the torch for the MLK teach-in for many years. And um, you know, this program, this panel was originally going to be a part of an in-person MLK teach-in that was going to take place in January. Um, we had to cancel that in-person event because of Omicron. Um, we're hoping to return um, next uh, January, um, but we decided that we would have um, some of the panels that we organized um, in this webinar format just to bring these amazing people to your attention sooner rather than later. Um, and so, for example, we did a panel on reparations, um, a webinar on reparations uh, with Marissa Baradurin, um, Jamelia Mor uh, Morgan, and uh, Bob Solomon um, in January. Um, this is the second uh, of those webinars, and we might have another to come. We will certainly uh, get the word out um, if we're going to be doing any additional uh, webinars associated with the MLK teach-in. Um, you know, the immiseration of low-wage workers, um, particularly along racial and gender lines, is a core issue uh, that we face um, in the United States and globally, more generally. Um, um, uh, and uh, we thought that it would be really valuable to learn from three kind of uh, 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 alums growing their expertise in the field, all of whom work in three you know, different settings, um, but bring uh, great commitment, dedication um, to uh, the work. Um, so let me introduce um, each of our panelists. Um, I'll go alphabetical order. Nora Cassidy graduated uh, from UCI Law in 2017. Um, uh, she is an attorney at Legal Aid at Work in the Gender Equity and LGBTQ Rights Program, as well as um, kind of the, the lawyer who's working in the Central Valley Workers' Rights Project. Um, and she'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, Ginger Grimes graduated um, UCI Law Class of uh, 15. Um, she is an associate attorney at Goldstein, Borgen, Dardarian, and Ho in Oakland. Um, and again, she will say more about um, her work in just a few minutes. Finally, David Rodwin um, was a member of the inaugural class um, at UCI Law. He graduated in 2012. Um, he is an attorney at uh, the Public Justice Center um, and has been there since graduation, I believe, and uh, been doing um, excellent work in Maryland, uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, so why don't we start? I'm going to ask each panelist to say a little bit about their position um, and their organizations, um, as well as um, briefly talk about the trajectory, how they've arrived um, at the place that they're at. Um, and then we'll transition to speak more substantively about their work. So Nora, do you wanna, do you wanna start us out? Sure, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for being here. Uh, as Samir said, my name is Nora, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an attorney at Legal Aid at Work. Um, so I am speaking to you from Modesto, California, which is my hometown and where I have been working since the pandemic began. So I started at Legal Aid at Work in November of 2019 after uh, completing two clerkships, one on um, with a magistrate judge in the district court in Puerto Rico and one with the Ninth Circuit in Pasadena. Um, and I knew that I wanted to work at the intersection of immigrant rights and workers' rights, thanks to uh, all of my pro bono and clinic opportunities at, at, um, at UCI. And so I was, I knew that I also wanted to be at Legal Aid at Work. Um, so this is happily where I ended up. 
and I was focusing mostly on sexual harassment and sexual assault cases uh, on behalf of immigrant workers based in our gender equity and LGBTQ rights program. And then as I'll talk about more in the substance of the work part of the discussion, uh, I we were able to get a grant for to launch a Central Valley Workers' Rights Project and hire a community organizer. Um, and so she and I work now here in the Central Valley uh, serving low-wage workers. Um, that is something that Legal Aid at Work does all across the state, providing direct services, litigation, education, outreach, policy work. Uh, but we are particularly focused on this region here and serving low-wage workers and particularly immigrant and undocumented folks, since we noticed that that was a particular gap in services. Excellent, thanks, Nora. And again, I will drill down on uh, the work, the industries, um, you know, that um, uh, the workers that you're you're focused on. Um, in, in again, in just a few minutes, Ginger, do you want to say something about your um, trajectory and your current position, your firm? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ginger Grimes. Um, after graduating from UCI, I clerked um, in the state of Hawaii Intermediate Court of Appeals. Um, which is where I grew up. So that was nice to get to go home. Um, and then my job now, I focus on class, collective and representative actions. So groups of workers or other um, groups. I mostly do workers' rights work, but I also do a variety of other cases. I do some consumer rights. I do some voting rights, which has been like some of the most meaningful work I've done as an attorney. Um, I do some disability rights, but primarily I do workers' rights and I mostly represent workers in California. Um, and I get to do that because California has this really robust history of uh, supporting uh, workers. Um, it's almost Cesar Chavez Day, right? And I think it's important in light of that holiday to recognize like that was an interracial movement um, in the 60s, Mexican-American workers, Filipino-American workers came together and realized that they had more to gain by working together than um, by standing in each other's ways, you know, despite the linguistic and cultural differences. And where I grew up in Hawaii, it's one of the most racially diverse places in the world. And part of that is because white plantation owners purposefully recruited workers from different countries that couldn't speak the same language in hopes that if they couldn't communicate, then they couldn't organize. Um, and my family's existence in, in America is part of that legacy. Um, so I think it, you know, our movement for workers' rights, for economic justice, you know, it's important that it's interracial, it's multicultural, it's feminist, it's queer, because um, we all work <laughs> and we all deserve dignity in our work. And, and I get to do what I get to do um, because of people like Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, Larry Itleon. And I recognize that. And I'm very proud to, to get to represent California workers. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ginger. Um, uh, David, do you want to say something about um, your trajectory and your, your organization? Yeah, thanks, Samir. Um, Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Rodwin. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm an attorney at the Public Justice Center in Baltimore, Maryland, as Samir said. Um, sort of particularly fun to do this with Samir moderating because um, at that time it was, it was, you know, the Immigrant Rights Clinic exclusively, but it was Samir sort of leading it. And so it was the Immigrant and Workers' Rights Clinic, essentially. Um, and we represented a group of hotel workers from the Long Beach Hilton. And it was that experience that crystallized my desire to um, find a job where I could work directly with low-wage, underpaid workers, particularly in the in the service sector. Um, I had a sort of focus on economic justice generally, but um, was sort of searching for where I wanted to um, focus. So uh, anyway, nice, nice to, to be on this, this panel today. Um, in terms of my personal trajectory, so um, graduated in 2012, um, went to clerk in Baltimore. Um, then to, I, I had initially planned on trying to study Spanish before law school, but postponed that when um, 
when I got into UCI. So I went to Guatemala for about 10 months um, after the first clerkship and then came back and, and clerked again and um, did the, the fellowship application thing. And when I did not get a SCAD in and when I had my um, Equal Justice Works fellowship application pending, um, worked with the organizational sort of home, the Public Justice Center, um, to write a grant application for a local Maryland foundation that was essentially the, you know, the, the fellowship application that I had worked on. And um, when we got that, I just sort of got to work at the, at the Public Justice Center. Um, and then they funded my work for the next five years, I guess. Um, and it worked out really well. Um, and so the Public Justice Center, they have a variety of different projects. I'm in our workplace justice project where we work to advance um, a right to work with dignity for all people. Um, the PJC also has some other projects, uh, a housing rights project, which primarily represents people in rent court uh, in Baltimore City, people facing eviction, um, but also works on, you know, all of the projects work on policy issues, pr primarily at the state level as well. We also have an education stability project, which mostly represents um, students in public school facing school pushout, a health and benefits project, uh, and an appellate project, and a sort of a small prisoner's rights project. Um, and I guess I'll save the rest of it for the, the later questions. <laughs> Okay. Um, thank you, David. Um, and uh, yes, I still remember going to uh, prepare uh, hotel housekeepers uh, for their hearings in Long Beach. Um, so thank you for, um, for um, uh, r reminding me of that um, experience. Um, I, uh, maybe we can drill down a little bit on uh, for each of you with regard to the types of workers that you work with um, and the kinds of uh, advocacy that you do. Um, and maybe, uh, yeah, any, anyone who wants to start um, to talk a little bit more about the substance of your, of your, of your work, your day-to-day -day work and your, you know, the kind of larger goals of that work. Ginger, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I don't work with a particular industry, um, unlike David and Nora. Um, but what I do sort of my niche is doing class and collective and representative actions. And, and these are sort of procedural devices that have you know, particularities amongst them. Um, but the, the point is that if you have a bunch of people, a bunch of workers, for example, that have similar interests, for example, they're suing their employer for back wages, um, it's more efficient to do it collectively. Um, than it is to do a bunch of individual cases. It's, it also saves employers money. Not that that's why I do what I do, but <laughs> um, that has been increasingly difficult given um, the trajectory of our federal court system, <clears throat> which is why I do most of my cases now in state court because California courts are it's hit or miss, but tend to be a little bit friendlier to, um, to workers. Um, so yeah, not, no particular industry. Um, I don't focus on low wage workers or high wage workers. I represent people who make way more money than I do sometimes, but, um, they all deserve the same rights. Well, maybe I could, um, just drill a little bit further, which is, mm -hmm. uh, on cases that might focus more on the low wage sector, what are the kinds of conditions that you end up litigating on behalf of groups of workers? So for me, most of my cases are um, have to do with wage and hour. So I don't really do uh, workplace safety, mm -hmm. um, which is an increasingly important part, you know, particularly during the pandemic of um, uh, California workers rights cases mm -hmm. so that is mostly like overtime issues meal and rest breaks mm -hmm. um wage statements mm -hmm. um things like that like when the employers don't tell workers the hours they work the wages mm -hmm. they work. oh right there's no that's the wage statement claim right 
You will, yeah. So, or or they will um, be a little bit vague about the rates at which they're paying employees, and then employees mm-hmm. can't figure out how they're being paid, and they can't mm-hmm. look back and see if their employer is paying them correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the big ones. I have a few cases right now that involve um, nurses and and paramedics who have been worked really hard mm-hmm. during the pandemic, and they've literally put their lives on the line to care for people with um, COVID, mm-hmm. and their employers are being really stingy about when they can take breaks. And they're, my clients are so burnt out um, and just are treated so unfairly. They've put so much on the line and their employers are just nickel and diming them still. And just one more question, which is on, on the substance of the work, which is what are like the largest uh, representative actions that you've been doing um, in terms of the number of workers that you might your firm might represent in a, in a case? Um, probably my biggest case right now involves about 5,000 commissioned sales employees for Oracle, mm-hmm. which is a very large corporation, and mm-hmm. it's only California workers. Um, so that's a lot of people. Great, great. Thank you. Um, uh, David, did you want to say a little bit about um, your, your your particular area of focus and the kinds of work that you're doing? Yeah, so um, from the beginning of my time at the PJC in 2015, I've focused on home care workers. So um, home care workers are people who go into the home of someone else to provide them with care and supports that enable them to live independently in their home and community. Um, Generally speaking, there's like a few different care settings. One might be a nursing home and there's, you know, a very um, prominent uh, movement by people with disabilities to transition from um, institutionalized settings into um, community-based settings. And so partially because of that and partially just because I think um, popular preferences have changed. A lot more people are aging in place or um, even apart from age, just people with disabilities want to remain in their homes and communities. So that has meant that there's been a huge explosion in the number of home care jobs, Um, but the jobs are by and large terrible. And- um, Terrible. They're they're mostly, well, the um, two ways, primarily. I think about job quality, mostly in terms, uh, well, in, in a bunch of ways, two of which I'll you know, have, have a legal remedy potentially. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so one way is just pay, they're paid very low. Um, that you know, has a long history to it. Uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is the federal minimum wage and overtime law, which was passed in 1938 um, as part of the New Deal suite of legislation. Um, the way it got passed was FDR, capitulated to Southern senators and excluded domestic workers and agricultural workers who at that time in the South in particular, especially were black people. So it was a way for the, you know, sort of like white ownership class in the South to not count black workers as workers under federal law entitled to basic bedrock protection. So um, domestic workers of whom, you know, home care are sort of a a subset Mm -hmm. Um, were historically excluded from these laws. And then one, you know, that, that changed in 1974. And then there's a, I won't go into the details of the sort of regulatory stuff that happened after that. But it takes a long time to actually change things once there's been a sort of um, frame set at the outset. So that, that frame that was set in 1938 has had a very long tail to it. Um, so th- the pay is very low. Part of that is that most home care jobs are funded by Medicaid and Medicaid both is, you know, doesn't do an adequate job just sort of funding the jobs, but they also don't do a good enough job providing oversight of the um, home care agencies, the private home care agencies that get the, this combination of federal and state money, which is how Medicaid works, um, to provide home care. So there's a, a big oversight problem. Um, so there's, there's the pay and then there's, uh, employment classification. So employees um, have rights. You know, when when you know, people who are watching this, I'm sure you've had jobs where you've gotten a W-2 and you know, you're a W-2 employee 
and um, employees have rights to certain things like minimum wage and overtime and certain benefits. Um, and there's another category of worker called independent contractor, which is basically everything that's not an employee. And independent contractors do not have rights um, of almost any kind, uh, in including minimum wage and overtime, but also a whole suite of, of benefits. Um, in Maryland, you know, paid sick leave and there's you know, health insurance federally and there's lots of other things too. So a great many in Maryland anyway, home care workers are misclassified as independent contractors, not paid overtime, not paid compensable, what's called travel time, time spent traveling from one work site to another work site, which in this case is a client's home to another client's home. So um, what we do is we represent these workers in, in wage theft suits as a way to change the way that things are done with job quality uh, in home care in Maryland. Um, their class and collective actions, like Ginger was was describing her cases are. Um, you know, a, a large case, a class might have several hundred people, but oftentimes we worry about collectability. And so we do more often, um, we'll, we'll plead a case as a class and collective action. In other words, we put into the complaint class claims, but also there's this, I mean, we haven't mentioned what a collective action is, but it's a species of group case that exists under the Fair Labor Standards Act, which again is the federal minimum wage and overtime law, where instead of opting out of a case as you have with a class, you opt into it. So you get noticed that there's this lawsuit and you can send a form to the lawyer saying, I wanna join this case. Um, so I think our, our biggest one had something in the low 30s um, in terms of workers. And then again, and we wanna make sure that we can collect for the workers who, who join. Um, so, uh, you know, it, and we also do, uh, in addition to this litigation work, um, policy advocacy in, in Maryland state capital is Annapolis. So we go there and try and get some state laws that are better for this worker population and other low wage underpaid uh, worker populations. And then we do, worker outreach, so you know, sort of know your rights outreach in, in collaboration with um, labor organizations, unions, but not only unions, you know, just community organizations, other worker groups, um, sometimes workforce development organizations. In other words, an organization that's providing some kind of training to, to workers, um, job training to workers. Um, and so, and, you know, in theory anyway, we're, we're, we're sort of working directly with worker groups, um, providing them information, but also, you know, hearing from them about what they're experiencing. We're litigating, and then we're also working to sort of change the, the laws in Maryland. Great, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Nora, um, do you wanna speak about sort of the geographical focus of your project, as well as the, the kinds of workers and problems that you come across? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the Central Valley is uh, 450 miles long, stretches from well north of, of Sacramento to Kern County, just like at the, the other side of the grapevine from Los Angeles. And so in, in theory, um, Jessica Carmona, who's our community organizer and I, are up for helping anybody who is in that region. Um, and we haven't said no yet, but we are focusing our efforts also within San Joaquin County, the, the um, main city there is Stockton. Uh, and that's where Jess is, um, Stanislaus County, which is where I am in Modesto, and then Merced County, which is just south of here. And so we've been particularly targeting our outreach and education efforts in these counties, as well as Fresno, because that's a one of the, the really one of the big population hubs of the Central Valley, and where a lot more the organizing that is happening is tending to happen um, there. And so we are doing our best to not have a focus and to not limit what we're doing because we're trying to be as responsive as possible to what folks are telling us. Um, and so just remaining really flexible and willing to, to learn new areas of law uh, um, or you know try out different tools to just figure out how we can be as helpful as possible to the clients who call our helpline, which we created um, 
but also with the community organizers and organizations who we're working closely with. And so everything that we're doing, which is, you know, folks call our helpline and then we'll provide legal advice and counsel at the moment. But then also if uh, we have the capacity and they want it, then I might also represent them or try and get them in contact with one of the other many attorneys at Legal Aid at Work who um, aren't focused on the Central Valley, but very much are able to represent folks here. And so we're also trying to just be a conduit to the, the vast resources of the Bay Area and kind of like get, get, get people those services. Um, and yeah, so and then, we, so representation, uh, we're uh, litigating a couple of cases right now um, in the Central Valley uh, and then but also doing a lot of um, education, both directly to workers, um, but also to a lot of service providers, because there just really isn't a lot of knowledge here with employees or employers or, um, you know, service providers of, of what rights are and ways to vindicate those rights. And so we're trying to do as much as we can to kind of build up the capacity of the folks mm -hmm. here and sort of provide that legal tool to them in whatever way is helpful. Can, uh, Nora, could you say um, what kinds of cases? You said you're representing workers and you're also referring cases to your colleagues at Legal Aid at Work in San Francisco. What are the typical cases that you might be representing workers in the Central Valley on? Yeah, so yes, very much only things that are related to the workplace is our lens. Um, but within that, uh, I have developed some health and safety knowledge, as Ginger mentioned, that has been, you know, folks are calling and asking about help and um, with, you know, just yeah, everything related to COVID-19, mm -hmm. but also there are just a lot of workplace health and safety issues here because there really isn't any oversight. Um, and so it's a little bit of the, the wild west mm -hmm. uh, in terms of that. Um, we are, our project is housed within the gender equity and LGBTQ rights program. And so we still very much have a focus on serving um, women and non-binary workers and folks who are facing uh, discrimination or harassment because of their gender, gender identity, sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. um, we have to, I would say, work harder to, to reach those clients um, because that's just, uh, us, and we're also working with undocumented immigrant folks who are facing immigration-based retaliation, which is another big thing that the um, topic area that we work on. And so making sure that people can trust us as a resource and come forward about these, you know, experiences that they're having and knowing that we're not going to push them to do anything that they don't want to do or things like that. And so that's very much a focus of our work. We also um, have been doing a lot of disability discrimination uh, cases and then certainly wage theft. I think that's uh, can sometimes be the door to people coming to us because once somebody stops getting paid, that can often be the catalyst to um, really being willing to come forward about what's been going on. But then as the conversation continues, uh, other issues come up. And so, um, yeah, with discrimination, harassment, health and safety sort of areas. You know, I have so many questions uh, for all of you about your practices. Um, and maybe I'll just say them without asking them. But like, for example, why is there an organizer, right? In your, in your project, Nora, maybe we'll get to that uh, when we talk about the relationship between law and organizing. Um, um, but one larger question I wanted to ask all three of you and anyone can answer. By the way, we have Crystal Adams asked, of course, the first question um, uh, amongst the participants. So we really appreciate that. And I will get, get to that question. Um, others who are watching, if you wanna ask questions, please put your questions in the Q&A box and uh, we will uh, try to, to get to everything um, that we can um, with these um, three panelists. Um, but Nora, you mentioned basically that there's no health and safety oversight 
even during in the aftermath or during in the aftermath of the pandemic with regard to conditions that workers are facing and we find that as well in a cl clinic case we're doing in collaboration with the united farm workers in bakersfield um what so where is the state and when i say the state i mean the government um whether it be local state or federal in the areas that you all are working in like you know presumably there is a role for the state in mediating and protecting workers against the way in which businesses work and the way in which businesses are trying to squeeze labor costs to its bare minimum um so where is the state um in in all of the 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 kind of areas that you all are working in does anyone want to kind of start um to answer that question I, I can just kind of go off of your point about working with the United Farm Workers. Um, you know, they were also doing a lot of organizing, for instance, in Livingston at the Foster Farms plant there, which is a massive chicken processing plant. The Central Valley is home to a lot of meat processing and food processing. It's one of the big industries here. And so when the pandemic hit and there are just innumerable COVID-19 cases in Livingston at this plant, the UFW uh, was working there and, and trying to improve those conditions along with a community group who we work closely with at Jakara Movement that does a lot of work with Punjabi Sikh um, workers. And the, they are getting a lot of pushback from the local government. And, you know, so, so I think one thing that I've been experiencing and that other folks have been experiencing, we also work a lot with Little Manila Rising. This is in Stockton. It's a um, really cool uh, Filipino community group. Um, and they, there just isn't the local support that you might find in San Francisco or Los Angeles. And so while the state might be there ostensibly, you know, we, we have access to the same agencies that others do, there isn't really that partnership on a, a more local level. Um, and so- In you fact, it, it, sounds like it sounds like they're pushing back on you in some cases in order to protect local industry. Do I have that right from what you just said? That's my perception of it, definitely, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> again, may not happen in coastal California or in Maryland, um, or maybe parts of Maryland, um, but certainly is happening in, in the, it sounds like maybe in the Central Valley and in, I imagine other parts of the United States as well, where government may be more prone to side with employers over employees. Um, did David, Ginger, did you wanna say something about the role of the state in your areas of work? Sure. Um, I have found it helpful to think um, of the state, not as the state, but rather as a set of agencies, each with their own particular interests, um, cultures and prerogatives, and then even just individual people um, with their own interests and, you know, um, sort of individual goals. And the reason is because, for that, is because, you know, I might think about well, what's in the best interest of the state of Maryland here? And I try and pitch it, pitch some policy as that, and no one cares. Like uh, these, these supposed representatives of the state who are sitting before me when I'm trying to pitch it, none of them care, none of them listen, none of them, you know, it doesn't resonate with them. And that's because what I'm pitching to them is something more abstract than the day-to-day -day reality of their job that they deal with. So, um, you know, the, the way, you know, I, see the state operating in this space is a state department of health that administers the state medicaid program that they're getting their orders from the state governor who wants to reduce costs one and protect um our very sacred small businesses um two and how that plays out is the Maryland Department of Health does not want to do any, you know, there's, there's no inclination from the Department of Health to do anything to help workers in any way. And in fact, um, it's the opposite because um, the goal is to help um, the 
the term providers, one might think that the provider of, of care or services, you might think about the worker providing the care, mm -hmm. but the term is actually used not to refer to the worker. But when people say provider in, in this sphere that I'm talking about, they mean a for-profit company that employs or otherwise engages to work people who provide care or other services. Um, so we have a Department of Health that doesn't want to do anything other than reduce costs and you know protect the, the businesses. A Department of Labor that um, is also implementing the state, you know, our, our governor's um, goal of making Maryland a business-friendly state, um, which means there's no proactive enforcement of any kind in any field, in any sector. Um, it's entirely reactive and driven by what people might you know, um, you know, file complaints to the State Department of Labor about um, people don't file complaints to the State Department of Labor because they never go anywhere and, um, you know, they view it as a bureaucratic uh, black hole. So, um, and then it's a sort of vicious circle because then the State Department of Labor tells legislators, oh, look, we only got like 12 complaints last year. Things are great. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's, um, the, the state, you know, when it comes to health, health and safety, states are permitted by federal law to have their own state enforcement um, as long as it's equal to or more protective than OSHA. Um, Maryland is called, spelled, it's spelled like MOSH, like MOSH pit, M-O-S-H, but people call it MOSH. Anyway, um, Maryland Occupational Safety and Health. And what, you know, what's their interest, right? Well, you might have an individual inspector who's like really passionate about it and wants to go in and really do his or her or their job well um, and get really in the weeds with things. But, you know, what's the institutions, you know, they want less work for themselves. They want less paperwork and less stuff that takes up their time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, it's, it's, I'll, I'll just give a brief, very specific example of that. We filed a, health, a state health and safety complaint right at the beginning of COVID in March, 2020, at a, a, with respect to a, a pallet, you know, pallets are these things that people, they're used to pile things on top of, and so then you move them around for shipping. Um, a pallet repair and manufacture plant in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, workers were getting COVID, and then when we dug, and workers got suspended for complaining about their coworkers getting COVID and then not knowing anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, so we filed a health and safety complaint with COVID and non-COVID related health and safety things. Mm -hmm. The employer responded and was like, oh no, look at, here's a photo of the masks that we provide people, which workers had never seen before in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, and then the state agency just dismissed the complaint and was like, unless you, unless you can rebut this, you know, we're, we're just not going to take further action. They did no, no affirmative investigation of any kind. Yeah. And, you know, what is that? It, an individual person seeing this being like, ugh, looks like a mess. I don't want to go check out this COVID infested workplace. Yeah. The employer sent this photo and let's just see if we can, you know, move it aside quickly yeah. right here. So yeah. in any event, that's yeah. how, that's how we sort of see this. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, David, because you, you, um, very, uh, um, astutely, uh, argue to disaggregate the state as I was characterizing it. But, but unfortunately, it, it seems like even disaggregated, all of the agencies that you're talking about and the actors are, you know, kind of remain either acquiescent, complacent, uh, actively uh, opposed in some cases to workers. Um, so that's, that, that, that's interesting. But I think, it, I think you're completely right that it's important when you're kind of trying to do advocacy to try to see um, each arm of the state as, um, as, as individual and maybe susceptible to certain kinds of persuasion, potentially. Um, Ginger, I wanted to ask you, um, do you think that, um, you know, collect, the collective action, um, and particularly under the um, uh, PAGA, uh, is under danger um, at the Supreme Court um, in the Viking River case that's being argued uh, tomorrow. Do you think that collective actions uh, or class actions give workers voice um, in, the, in the companies that they work for, in the industries more generally? Has that legal tool served to um, improve conditions of work um, you know, across sectors? 
I'll, go, I'll answer your question and then maybe do a little explanation on, on PAGA for folks who aren't familiar with it, which is, I think, actually related to your last question about state. what is, where's the state? Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, based on my experience with my clients who are very fearful of retaliation and who, for the most part, really enjoy their jobs class and collective actions make them feel like they're not alone, that they're standing together to assert their rights against their employers. And every so often you get one worker who's like totally brave and willing to do it on their own, Mm -hmm. but that's definitely not the experience of most of my clients. It often takes a group of people coming together to say, okay, now we feel comfortable that we're not going to get picked off individually, that we have these retaliation protections Um, that protect a group of us. Um, I think it also, especially for um, opt-in cases where you have to have workers actually affirmatively deciding that they want to join a case, it feels really good for the plaintiff to see dozens or hundreds of people opting into a case because then they feel like, okay, like I did do this for the right reason. Mm -hmm. People are on board with it. Maybe they didn't want to put their name out there. Maybe they weren't in a position to put their name on a pleading um, to risk their reputation of future employment. Um, um, But it makes them feel much better. Um, On on PAGA, so where is the state? Uh, You know, we started talking about this panel in late 2021, and my whole idea was like, oh, California is doing these really great things. I'm so proud to be in California. Um, (laughs) We had, you know, for a while, um, Julie Sue as our labor commissioner, who I saw for the first time when I was at UCI um, and and who made her reputation representing Thai garment workers in um, in LA. And, you know, a workers' rights advocate leading our state version of the Department of Labor. Um, In the early... 2000s, workers advocates came together um, to pass a law called the Private Attorneys General Act. It recognized that the state of California did not have enough resources to fully fund its state Department of Labor, the Labor Commissioner. Um, And California's economy was growing. There were just so many employers and the state was totally unable to investigate employers at the rate that they wanted to. So they passed this law that enabled individual employees basically to step in the shoes of the state and to prosecute labor violations on behalf of the state. And you can go after penalties. So the the point of the law is to penalize employers for violating labor laws. Um, It's supposed to deter employers from violating workers' rights. that is now coming under threat. It's procedurally a little bit different than the class and collective actions we've been talking about. Um, You don't have to satisfy all of the class certification requirements, um, like um, which can be very tricky and and maybe we'll get to this, but put some specific burdens on class counsel. Um, And so that is now coming under threat because, I'll try to make this quick. <laughs> Over the course of the last decade or so, the, the Supreme Court of the United States has been um, enforcing arbitration agreements and enforcing class waivers. Um, and it has been avoiding this question of whether PAGA cases that are technically representative actions, not class actions, can be compelled to arbitration. And it's been like, a lifeline in California because where we can't do class actions, where we can't do collective actions, at least we can do this type of case that still punishes employers for um, violating workers' rights. Um, It's being argued tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's not going to go well. (laughs) Most likely, we're not hopeful. Um, And it's really going to change, I think, the landscape for workers in California. Okay. So thank you, Ginger. I mean, it's amazing what you did in the time that you did it in, in terms of um, explicating complex areas. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and just again, I love the brilliance of UCI law grads um, and to hear you all talking. Um, so maybe this is a time to pivot back to that question that I asked earlier uh, about why there's an organizer in the Central Valley Project, right? 
what what are the limits of legal tactics um, in um, the a representation um, and advocacy for low wage workers? And what are uh, what ways in which uh, what are ways in which lawyers uh, might work on um, extra legal uh, means by which to achieve uh, a greater degree of worker power um, in, in workplaces as well as in industries and sectors um, across the board. Uh, Nora, do you want to start us um, in, in, a, in that? In that, and maybe you can also help us understand the theory of social change that drives putting you in the Central Valley with an organizer. Yeah, so um, we, when uh, I was putting together this grant proposal in um, October of 2020, uh, I said that I'd be happy to do the project, but that we had to try and hire an organizer as well, because um, that, I, I didn't want to have a kind of top-down model in doing this work. Uh, this is my hometown and I didn't want to come in with like a, like a carpet bagger sort of idea of, um, uh, yeah, bringing in the, coming in from the Bay Area, staying for a short period of time and then leaving again. And so um, what having Jess and I working together has allowed us to do is be more responsive in, in the ways that I was uh, talking about. So for instance, we're in the middle of an 18 month long like client feedback model that, that we signed up for. And so figuring out how to get meaningful feedback from clients about what we're doing and then also how to incorporate that feedback in a way that makes folks feel heard and empowered. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something that having uh, an organizer who's building the relationships with these clients is, is enabling us to do and to try and even within our own work, address those quite severe power imbalances um, that are in every attorney client relationship. Um, and we've also been working to ask to respect the expertise of the, the folks who have, who are here and doing the work already. And just at, like, what do you need from us? Uh, and so kind of staying, working on staying in my own lane and like appreciating the, what I do bring to the table and not imposing further than that and saying, you know, here's some suggestions of things that we could do to help your organizing. Um, because so much of the work that's being done here is just about basic education of, of the rights that folks have. They're eager, they know that what's happening is wrong, but nobody has talked about the fact that there's actually a law against it. Um, or that together they could like go to an employer. Um, that's just not really conversations that are happening here. And so I am working with the folks who are facilitating those conversations and trying to basically offer free legal services, which is something that also doesn't exist here because there aren't really a whole lot of foundations or like money coming in. Um, and, and California Rural Legal Assistance is the, the the big legal service provider here, um, but nice. they accept LSC funding and can't support undocumented folks in almost all instances. Mm -hmm. So um, there's that, and there's also doing some um, connecting of folks. So using the fact that we have more resources uh, to be able to per be the, the conduit between different organizations and, and services uh, and just kind of like offering up what we have. And to me, that is getting us slightly closer to uh, a world where workers in the Central Valley are building up their own power and are having their basic needs met, which would then free them up mm -hmm. to participate more fully in, in the community and, you know, bettering the lives of, of themselves and their families and, and others. And so trying to put out some of the big fires at the same time of, you know, even basic, like in any legal advice. And then next time, like here are some other ideas of like how you could protect yourself better. 
here are some samples, here are some things, just trying to kind of democratize yep. what we learned in law school. I, I also heard you in your earlier answer talking about some organizations that you've been working with, like Little Manila Rising and Jakara. And, and that's very intriguing to the extent to which there isn't a great public interest infrastructure in the Central Valley, but it's interesting if there's something of a grassroots organizing infrastructure that you're helping to sort of grow and support is what it sounds like. Um, yeah. um, David, I, I wanted, you've been thinking about the relationship between law and organizing for some, certainly since your time in the clinic at UCI, if not before that, um, and in your work, do you have thoughts on um, kind of uh, building worker power um, in the sector that you've been focused on? Is it going to happen through cases or cases and something else? What is that? It's definitely not going to happen only through cases. Um, we, I mean, I, I had a conversation with um, someone at the, the local branch chapter, I don't know what they call them, office of the U.S. Department of Labor, um, who, I mean, he described the, the home care situation in Maryland as, as whack-a-mole because there's, there's like 1,300 home care agencies mm -hmm. and, you know, some very large percentage of them, more than half, are misclassifying their workers as independent contractors. And you, you sue one or, you know, the DOL does an investigation of one and, you know, fine, six months later, a year later, two years later, you get a favorable resolution. But, you know, five have sprung up in the meantime who are doing the same thing. So um, one lesson that I definitely took out of um, the clinic was um, working with unions to, I mean, you can, you can do everything that you could do with a standalone lawsuit, but leverage that to accomplish more by doing it in support of a union's efforts. So, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, I don't know if UCI law still does the common law analysis, public ordering, common law analysis, private ordering thing. Is that, is that still? It's still a thing. Anyway, it's yeah. still a thing. Okay. Yeah. So I, I actually do think, I mean, at the time, I think, you know, I was one of the people who was like, what is this? Let's just call it what all the other law schools call it. What are we doing here? But I actually think it's quite useful to think about how, um, you know, rules, binding rules are made and enforced. You can have, I mean, a union comes into existence, un, you know, under the rules that, that law has provided, but then it enters into a private agreement with a company that provides a separate set of rules that the company needs to comply with um, that is, you know, greater than what the law would otherwise provide. Um, so I think, you know, lawyers can simultaneously enforce, you know, statutes, the law, um, minimum requirements, while also um, working to get workers into a position where they're getting a better situation than what those basic minimum, you know, insubstantial requirements are. Mm -hmm. And that can be done by supporting unions. And then you can also work to, you know, change what the statutes are. Mm -hmm. um, which is also, um, you know, I think valuable and important and enormously difficult and frustrating in its own way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in part, it's kind of raising the floor that's offered by statutory protections, while then also facilitating the development of worker organizations that could, that could set uh, standards in a given workplace or in a given sector uh, above that floor, right? Some, some, some amount above that floor, potentially. Yeah, exactly. And I, I um, the, we actually, there was a speaker in like 2011 or something um, that um, Henry Weinstein brought, um, Peter Sabonis from then, he was then with National Economic Social Rights Initiative. I'm not sure where he's now. Anyway, he's based in Baltimore. So he sort of taught me this, this framework of sort of a three-step thing where, um, you know, we, we simultaneously try to, in, you know, the reality of the world that workers face is below what the law provides. So you raise that level of the reality to match what the law provides, but then you also raise what the law provides to try to be something greater than that. And that can be through either, you know, a, a private collective bargaining agreement, or it can be through, you know, changing what the law provides. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, we're not going to get to the bottom of any of this in this hour, unfortunately. And that it's, but I did want to respond to or maybe Ginger, you can help us start us off. Um, Crystal Adams and Professor Karen Gustafson asked a somewhat similar question about 
what you'd suggest to students um, in terms of classes, clinics, pro bono experiences for students who are interested in workers' rights. Do you want to start us out? Maybe we just have a quick uh, go around uh, amongst the three of you for um, things that you'd suggest. Well, obviously the Immigrants' Rights Clinic, <laughs> <laughs> which all three of us were involved in. Um, I Really, I feel like the one of the most important experiences I had at UCI was doing the Workers' Rights Clinic. Um, with Legal Aid at Work. And when I applied for my job in Oakland, um, I called up my supervisor and said, hey, do you know the attorneys at this firm? And he said, uh, Mike Gately. And he said, yeah, they're actually, one of them is on our board. Like, let me give him a call and I'm going to recommend you for the position. And I am 100% sure that that's how I got my job um, because of that connection and that experience. And he could really advocate for me knowing how, um, I had worked with clients and my strengths and weaknesses, and he could say something really specific to my bosses. And that was just a really incredible and valuable experience. I think learning from Mike Gately and working with Mike Gately is probably one of the core uh, yeah. <laughs> advice that we could offer to folks. Um, Nora, did you want to, did you want to say something about experiences? Uh, Yes, I was also able to sneak into the workers' rights clinic like my 3L spring once I realized that I wanted to do workers' rights, and that very much led to me being here. Um, I completely agree with everything that David said in the chat. I also think that um, learning to speak or already speaking the language of the community you want to work with is huge. I feel like organizations are finally paying attention to that, and um, I would you know, encourage folks to, to work on their language skills. And I think I would also not get discouraged. I, um, you know, David mentioned not getting a Scadden Fellowship. I also didn't get a Scadden Fellowship. Legal Aid at Work got some internal funding, like four months into my fellowship, then the funder pulled the money. And somehow it all ended up with, you know, being grant funded and actually doing the work that I've went to law school to do. Um, and so I just think that we sometimes get this idea that there are only very certain ways that you can do public interest. And if you get turned down, then that's it. Um, and I would just hope that people don't get discouraged and always happy to be a resource for folks. I also hope folks don't get discouraged by our focusing on the problems that all three of you and, and we in the clinic at UCI are facing in, in the field. I, I, I think you all would agree with me that watching workers build solidarity with each other against abusive employers is probably, and helping to facilitate that is probably one of the best things you can do as a lawyer. So, um, you know, um, it's an incredibly rewarding area of work. Uh, it's an affirmative area of work and it's a solidaristic area of work. Um, and I'm so proud uh, that all three of you are working in the field and uh, you should know that UCI law has your back um, as you as you move forward. Um, David answered the question um, in, in chat, so take a look at that um, already. Um, thank you to all three of you uh, for joining us and giving us your time, and thanks to all those who were listening in, and we look forward to more, more opportunities to interact. Thank you so much. All right, take care.